On this episode of STV, we're going to catch up with the organizers of one of the wildest snowmobile races on the planet, Kane's Quest in Labrador. Then we're going to road trip here in Ontario to a team that's prepping to enter that race. And then at some point during the show, I'm going to try to figure out what kind of rider I am. So stick around. STV is brought to you by Yamaha, revs your heart. 509, fueling your passion. And by Polaris, think outside. Kane's Quest is an adventure race that crisscrosses the desolate landscape of the province of Labrador. Now, typically, this race runs only every other year, but it's back again in 2024 after they had to call it off halfway through the 2023 event. But basically, they ran out of winter. Due to the distances involved, we're going to chat with Chris Lacey in Labrador City via Zoom to discuss what's about to kick off in 2024. Before we jump into uh, 2024, let's look back at 2023. Give me a, a recap on last year's event and uh, and what happened there. Last year's event it was a was a fun one to say the least. Um, we left Lab City. It was minus 20. It was crisp and cold, and everything was great. And it was couldn't ask for a better start line. You couldn't ask for a better start line. And within 24 hours, uh, we had over 100 millimeters of rain on the coast. Cartwright and uh, different communities got unprecedented amounts of rainfall and do because of the ice and the snow as most of the snow those understand it didn't have nowhere to go so it just flooded the rivers it flooded the valleys and and flooded all the flatlands that normally would never have water on us and it just made the conditions around Labrador so impassable that it uh, we couldn't there was no safe possible way to make it around any route normally we make take things into consideration that okay well route a might not be impassable but route b might be okay a little harder but it might be okay but there was really no way to go around safely for all people to make it and uh, keep them warm and dry at the same time because temperatures were supposed to drop and then you risk other aspects when you're wet and cold and then you bring freezing temperatures into it so but it was unprecedented it made uh, the weather turn from <clears throat> a bright nice winter crisp day to a summer rainfall in a matter of a couple of hours and it, uh, it really turned us upside down now, normally, Kane's Quest is an event that happens every other year. Why are you guys running this two years in a row? We haven't had a finish line since 2020. To go to 2025 and race, it would be five years without a finish. Five years without a banquet. Five years without having racers do what they got to do. And we felt it to be a demise of the race. We felt it to be people lose interest. People would lose the spark of the event would go away. And we felt it paramount to the event to have a race in 2024 in order to keep the interest flowing, keep the hype going. And uh, it also, on a flip note of that, it gets us back in the even years, 24, 26, 28, which offsets us from other events that happen in our region in Labrador. We have winter games and a bunch of different things. And uh, there's only so many volunteers to go around. So to have it on that year, it also helps. But uh, the biggest reason was the fact that we really thought that five years without a finish would be uh, the death of the race. Now, with the uh, race coming back for 2024, are the communities along the race route, you know, looking forward to this? So what's the level of excitement up there uh, leading into uh, this year? It's actually better than 2023, personally, I feel. But I feel that the race communities, the checkpoints and all the people and all the racers are more hyped about this race than they ever were because of how bad last year was. The hype around this race is the most we've ever seen in a long time when it comes to people wanting this to come and go together. Uh, we kept the same route as we did in 2023 for the simple fact that we didn't get to finish it. Um, and again, we usually change our route up slightly. There's not a whole lot changing we can do in, in certain things, but uh, we didn't this time because we wanted to give those communities that, you know, put their faith in us in 2023 the ability to finish that. Because it's a big deal for racers to go through those communities in that way. So we wanted to keep those communities involved and keep the checkpoints in the, the way it was. So, But the hype is, uh, I, I'd say it's two times more than it ever was. Uh, that's awesome news. Now, I know Mother Nature, she can be fickle. What's long-term weather looking like for Labrador? The long-term forecasts are showing cold, showing some freezing temperatures and showing some snow coming. So 
hopefully we can get this uh, Mother Nature. Too bad we couldn't get her on board as a volunteer. It'd be great. Um, but uh, yeah, too bad. Hopefully she comes in and uh, she shows us what Labrador is all about, man. We can able to get this race happen on uh, March third. Well, that's awesome news. I think uh, I'm looking forward to coming up this year. And I know some racers that we're going to be seeing in the next segment are super looking forward to coming up this year. And uh, I think I've got pretty much everything I can cross or braid together um, in hopes that Mother Nature is going to cooperate this year. Yeah. Yes, that's right. So, yeah, we hope that. We're super excited to have you guys come back to Labrador and uh, and be part of this race and be part of the tourism side, side of things. And uh, we'll see if we can't get together and show everybody what Labrador is all about in all shapes and sizes. I cannot wait. It's going to be amazing. Awesome. Look forward to seeing you. Now that we know all about what's happening in the province of Labrador, we're hitting the road here in Ontario to visit with a team who's prepping to enter the quest for the very first time. Stick around, because that's happening later in the show. This segment is brought to you by Yamaha. Teams are coming from all over North America to compete in Kane's Quest, and we've come here to Gordon Bay Marine in the Muskoka Perry Sound region of Ontario to catch up with Muskoka Extreme Team number 44, who are prepping to enter their very first Kane's Quest adventure. We're here to meet Wayne, the team manager, and a pair of Chris's who are the riders of Team 44 to talk about the challenge they have ahead of them. Yeah, so on the team are our two racers, Chris Hilton and, and Chris Holmes. So I'm gonna, I got the double Chris's running on it. We're going to call it the H&H &H Club. Um, myself and Teresa. Teresa is going to be one of our backup riders. She's going to um, ride with me uh, on uh, our R&D sled uh, and then come up and do that, that journey up to Nain and whatnot. Um, at this point we've got uh, two younger people. We've got Darby and Noah that are going to be there as our support crew. Uh, and then there's some locals out there. That are, um, Chris Reed and uh, his partner are going to be doing some of the uh, support in the lower you know, eastern shore. So right now we're a, a small team, we've got two riders, six support crew, three, three vehicles and away we go. Yeah, so support uh, outside of the core group of people, our family, our core group of riders are with us and whatnot. Sponsorships is, is key. Um, not all sponsors come to the table with dollars, um, but a lot of them come uh, with product and facilities uh, and, and a lot of other ways of coming to support. And one of those key partners in this is Gordon Bay Marine. Uh, Gordon Bay's been in business for 60 years. They've been tied with Yamaha for most of that time. Uh, they spent a considerable amount of uh, time in the snowmobile industry here in the wintertime out of Gordon Bay Marine. Uh, Maple Leaf Marina has purchased Gordon Bay Marine. They did that in 2023. And Muskoka Extremes partnered with them across their uh, Muskoka offerings up here. They have 19 locations that we work out of as well. So it's key component to the success of this team and our safety uh, that we've got Gordon Bay and Maple Leaf Marinas involved in this project. Uh, my position uh, on the team for Muskoka Extreme is the hired gun. I'm a bit of a northerner. I've been traveling around quite a bit. I've been friends with Wayne for a while. He knows what skills I can bring to it, and it's a, it's a bit of an adventure. And uh, it's a lot of the safety background that, that I bring when we're two guys are out there riding around and two riders are out there. It's going to make a big difference knowing that, you know, there's two people out there that can take care of each other the whole way. A lot of stuff that's going to have me concerned while I'm up there uh, that I'm trying to get prepared for is the gear, the equipment, uh, the mental long game that you're going to have to play. You're inside that helmet. You're there with your partner. You need to talk. Uh, that's what's going to be the difference is how do, you, how do you take care of that part that isn't physical? Yeah, we all can uh, take a few Motrin to get through a bit of the pain, have a few balls of water, a couple extra stops, but what you're really missing is that, that stuff that's inside your head. You know, like uh, you're going to be going as fast as you want at the beginning, that big scream of woo -ah! as we're going down the trail. And then 14 hours in, you're going to be going, this sucks. You know, you got to be able to beat that monster up before you get going. The most extreme race that you can do, but the people are fantastic. When you get into the communities, they're there cheering you on. They're there at three o'clock in the morning, you know, welcoming you with a cup of coffee or, or whatever it is. And, you know, that's the sort of the community that you want to have going in. That's that safety net that you have, knowing that, you know, as soon as you get there, you're not alone. 
You know, you get to take that guy that was inside your helmet screaming and yelling and go, oh, there's people to talk to, not just, you know, Chris, which I'm probably gonna have great conversations with him, but it might be a long day sometimes. It's the other marriage I have to understand. <laughs> I'm nervous about the kickoffs ceremonies and, and actually it coming front and center to us. And uh, I'm scared, like I'm, I'm scared. Some days I'm cocky and I'm thinking, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. And other days I'm thinking, what am I doing? And then you listen to people and what they've gone through just to make, you know, one checkpoint to the other. And, and uh, the ladies that did the race, you know, that their headlight blew and they got stuck out all night. And then I'll have a good sleep, and then I'm back excited again. And uh, but it's it's scary and and exhilarating, and I don't even know. The emotions are all over the map. You know, like anything that's worth doing, um, Kane's Quest kind of offers a an all-encompassing adventure. Right? You're pushing against Mother Nature. You're pushing against yourself. You're pushing against the machine. Right? And you know, I've looked at other races and done other type of racing, and I think this is this is a true challenge, you know? And it encompasses so many different aspects. I think just to finish will be a massive accomplishment, you know? And and I think it's, it's also truly a team effort. It's such a vast area to cover. Like, I'm getting excited talking about it. I think this is gonna be a massive experience. There's, there's a no-lose here. You know, you stay safe. It doesn't matter if you finish or not. The experience is gonna be memorable. This segment is brought to you by 509. In my opinion, in the snowmobile world today, when it comes to choosing your sled, there's just too many choices out there. I mean, you got all the categories that range from mountain to crossover to trail to utility to youth to two up to touring. I mean, that goes on and on. And then you've got all the sub decisions you got to make when it comes to engine choice or the type and length of track you're going to put on the machine or the suspension you want on your machine or the tech that you're going to option or the colors of your machine, even your riding position and ski stance and, you know, what type a specific terrain that sled is designed to ride in. I mean, the choices and combinations just go on and on forever. So I'm going to evaluate myself and try to figure out what kind of rider I am now. And in that process, maybe you can take some of my strategy and use it to evaluate what kind of rider you are when looking for a sled new or used. My background is obviously more focused on flatland stuff, but I think thinking critically about your sled choice is the same no matter what category of sled you ride. Out in the wild, I've seen a lot of riders out there struggle with their choice of snowmobile. On the trail, I've seen folks choose sleds way too spicy for their skill level, or have chosen sleds with too much engine or too much suspension. It's the same in the mountains with folks choosing sleds more capable than they are and getting themselves into trouble or struggling to ride something that looks cool with a mile of track out the back while trying to ride in six inches of snow all day. Of course, you do you, boo-boo. I'm not going to tell you or anybody else what they should be buying or what they should be riding, but the better choice you make when it comes to selecting the snowmobile you are going to ride, the more enjoyment you're going to get out of a snowmobile season that's, let's face it, getting shorter and shorter all the time. To begin to narrow my riding style down, I'm not a two-up rider and I'm not a mountain goat either. But I am looking for decent power on the sleds that I ride. I also like fiddling with suspensions. I live in an area with lots of tight, twisty trails, but I also like riding big systems. So I think I've come to the conclusion I'm a performance trail guy. At this point in my life, I've had the chance to ride all kinds of different sleds and I've been through all the fads and phases a typical rider does. Now, I just want to focus on the enjoyment of sledding. Let's start. I've already said I'm a trail slash performance guy. Next thing to figure out is whether or not I'm a two stroke or a four stroke rider. And without going too far down that rabbit hole, I'm a two stroke guy. 
I like the sound, I like the smell, I like how the power hits, I just like them. And I also accept their shortcomings like longevity and the extra cost of oil consumption. So two strokes are in and that starts to narrow the field down, even cuts down on what manufacturers to focus on. Now I pretty much fall in love with any sled I'm holding handlebars on, but like you would have to do, I wanna narrow the field down to one manufacturer, so I'm choosing Polaris. Now all companies are building great stuff, but I do wanna put myself in the regular consumer shoes where most likely you only have one sled to ride and not a whole fleet of press vehicles from all manufacturers. Plus, I like Polaris and I've been a fan of these machines ever since I was a kid when I was riding my 650 up there. At this point in my evaluation, I've determined I'm a trail two-stroke Polaris guy and it's now the choices get interesting. And that's because in the Polaris lineup, they have three categories that I think I'm interested in pure performance, luxury with a good dose of performance, and crossover performance. But I can only choose one. And let's start with pure performance. And I feel the sled that best describes this category out of the whole Polaris lineup is the late model XCR. The XCR stands for Cross Country Racer and has been developed through Polaris' experience in cross country racing events like the I-500 and other races popular in the Midwest, Polaris' own backyard. Now what I like about this sled is that it hasn't been designed as a snowcross sled and then detuned for the trail. The XCR does this in the same matrix chassis as other sleds in the Polaris lineup, but the XCR has been fitted with an excellent set of 2-inch Walker Evans Velocity racing shocks in each position on the suspension. Now these shocks are tunable with preload adjustment and both high and low speed compression knobs. Rebound though is fixed from the factory because this shock has an internal needle on the shock shaft that ramps up compression to prevent bottoming out. Because of this, rebound adjustment can't be run through the center of the shock rod like on other setups. The XCR also has some other trickery on board with optimized geometry of the front arm of the rear suspension for better performance in the chatter an improved brake cooling system to avoid brake fade when speeds need to be scrubbed off time after time coming into the corners or whoop sections, and also critical components have been beefed up to take a beating. The next category is crossover, and the option here is the Polaris Switchback Assault, or the plain old switchbacks are options too, but I like the higher end suspension on the Assault package that includes WER, Walker Evans Racing Shocks, in all positions. 2-inch velocities are found up front, then 2-inch CAs in the middle, and regular old velocities out back. This is a very tunable package that can be optimized for more off-trail or on-trail conditions depending on where you're riding. But like all crossovers, there's a compromise to be made. To be effective, the Assault has to ride the line between on- and off-trail performance, and because of this, it can't be optimized for either. Most obvious is the track that's a little too long for the trail and not long enough for really steep and deep snow you can find off trail. Beyond the track, there are three engine choices here as well, which I will address later, but what is included here is the industry leading 7S display, which I want to address now. This display is available on all the models I'm interested in and is something that I would want on any sled that I ride. Now this is something that has definitely changed for me in the last couple of years. At first, I thought these systems were a bit of a gimmick, but the more time I spend with this type of feature on my sled, the more I miss it when it's not there. The last category for me is luxury performance, best personified in the Polaris lineup by the VR1 Boost. The VR1 option is available with 650 and 850 NA engines, but I'm gonna go with the Boost, which I think makes this the ultimate GT class performance sled. Built on the now familiar Matrix chassis, the VR1 is just one small step down in suspension class from the XCR with its Walker Evans racing shocks in all positions, but everything else about it elevates the experience for the trail rider. On the trail, the VR1 with any engine under the hood or track is an excellent place to be. Polaris has refined this sled to deliver on the high expectations of serious trail riders, yet hasn't overdone it. These are three pretty amazing platforms that are somewhat similar, but also very different. And after going through the details of each, I think I've made my decision and the sled that I choose is the XCR, but that's not the end of my decision-making process. Coming up later in the show, I've still got to go through the choices of engines and track and other tech and a bunch of other stuff too, so stick around. This segment is brought to you by Ultimax Belts. 
Now that I've got my platform nailed down, the next choice on my list is the type of track, which is something you may or may not have a choice of when it comes to buying your sled, either new or used. But tracks can be changed, so even if the perfect sled for you doesn't have the perfect track option, that's a problem that can be solved. Now the next option is one of the most important, the engine. This is something I actually struggled quite a bit with. Now, choosing an XCR platform, the boost isn't on the menu, but that leaves me with engine choices of either a 650 or 850. Engine choice can have a huge impact on costs for fuel consumption and insurance costs. And if I was staying more local to my home where the trail system is a little tighter, I would definitely go with a 650 for some cost savings. But I like to travel to some of the bigger systems, to places like New Brunswick, where a little more power can be put to use. So, at the end of the day, surprise, surprise, I'm an 850 guy. That's because in my world, there is just no replacement for displacement. There's a lot that goes into choosing the perfect sled, and for me, that's the 850 XCR with the 7S display. This is the sled that checks all the boxes on my needs and wants list. It has the power I want, the suspension I want, the tech I want, and it fits my riding personality and expectations, and I'm sure this sled will deliver on all of it, at least for now. Maybe in another 10 years or so, I'll be looking for a sled with the most comfortable backrest. But if I choose correctly at that time, I'll still be enjoying the ride. And I hope you will be too. Now, now that we've made the choice as to what your perfect snowmobile should be, it's up to mother nature to provide the white stuff. And we all know nature, she can be a real mother especially after the start of this season. See you next time on STV. Closed captioning is brought to you by Scott Snowmobile Goggles. STV has been brought to you by Best Western Hotels and Resorts. Wherever life takes you, Best Western is there. Ultimax Belts, performance driven, performance proven. And by Ford F-Series, Canada's best selling line of pickup trucks for 58 years. Hi, thanks for watching Snowmobiler Television. If you enjoy the show, please hit that like and subscribe button.